Good morning, CLC. Let's stand together. Thank you all for being here this morning and our online fam as well. Hope you guys had an amazing Christmas yesterday. Y'all ready to worship Jesus this morning? All right, let's do it. Come on. I'm letting out this fire tonight. It's burning in my spirit. I'm going to dance with all my might. I don't care who sees it. I'm going to let it out. Be just like a child and say, I love you, Lord. I might make a scene tonight. I might come on. as one family. Come on, let's sing together. Put off all my heaviness. Put on this garment of praise. I put off all my heaviness and I put on this garment of praise. Cause you turned my morning into dancing and you turned my night into day. I put off all my heaviness and I put on this garment of praise. You turn, you turn my morning into dancing and you turn my night into day. I put on all my heaviness and I put on this garment of praise. Cause you turn my morning into dancing and you turn my night into day. I put off all my heaviness and I put on this garment of praise. Cause you turn my morning into dancing Cause you turn my night into day
let's praise Jesus in this place this morning. Amen. Let's continue to worship together.
I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I've held everything together and watched it shatter. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender Chased my heart and drift and drifting home again Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption And every time I turn around, Lord
It's kind of love is who you are. It's a grace I could never add up to be somebody you still want. But somehow you love me as you find me. You love me as you find me. If you want my heart, I won't second guess. Cause I need your love I'm in, I'm yours Your love's too good to leave Thank you for your love, Jesus Your love's too good to leave me here Thank you, Jesus, for being our champion going before us. We worship you this morning. Things. Raise them to glory. 
Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being our champion, for going before us in every situation. We thank you for being born 2,000 years ago to one day die on a cross that we, we may have life in you and the promise and hope of eternity in heaven. So thank you for this Christmas season. Thank you for all that you've done over this this past month of December, those that have come to know you, God, the, the healing that's happened, God. And we just pray that as we go into this new year, you would continue just to bless this church, continue to uh, remind us of who you are, um, all that you've blessed us with, God. And so we're so grateful this morning to be here, grateful to, uh, to worship together, to learn and grow together. So we just give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. amen. Thank you guys for being here. You guys can be seated. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you had a merry, merry Christmas. Well, here at CLC, we believe in the importance of generosity, and we believe in the importance of making a difference. Scripture reminds us that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Each Christmas season here at CLC, we take a special what-if offering, where we say, what if we gave like it was Jesus' birthday? And this year is extra special because we have three ministries that we are going to be blessing with our What If offering. And the first is Compassion First, which is a clothing organization that has blessed thousands through clothing and furniture over almost 20 years. And we are excited as we're going to help find them a building and pay for their lease for the first three to five years. The second ministry is working alongside the Muzarts, who are missionaries in Ukraine. And what they do is they work with college-age students in Ukraine. And what is so special is they've seen dozens and dozens of people come to Christ. And then they take that gospel and it is being spread all throughout Europe. And then finally, we are excited because we're going to be part of a church a launching in Madagascar alongside the Rastafers. So we just want to say thank you to everybody who's been part of our What If already. We know that if about 1,000 CLC families give about $150, we'll be able to reach our goal of raising $150,000 to bless those ministries that are truly making a difference. There are three ways that you can give today. First, if you're here on campus, you can give in the black boxes in the back. The second way is you can give online at clcdayton.com. And the third and final way is you can give through our app. And we want you to remind you, if you are giving to the what if, make sure you just designate that on your giving envelope or hit the drop down tab. But again, Christian Life Center, we just want to say thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness in giving because your giving is making a difference here in Dayton, Ohio across the United States through various church plants and all the way around the world. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness, Lord. We thank you that we get to be a part of a church that has a God-sized vision that is making a difference all around the world. God, I pray blessings over this offering, God, that you will use it to multiply, to further your kingdom, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this Christmas season, and let us not forget of why we celebrate, Lord, that you would send your son to earth, to walk this earth, God, to eventually give us the opportunity to come into a relationship with him, to spend eternity with him. Lord, I pray that we are generous during this season, God, because you have blessed us so much that we are blessed to be a blessing, God. So we thank you for the ministries that are making a difference, God, and I pray that all that we do, God, we bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we want to make this a friendly place, so if you could stand, greet somebody, tell them that you said hello and that they look good and what your favorite Christmas treat was. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Come on, I'm so excited to see you, and I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for showing up. I didn't know if anybody would be here this morning from the Christmas hangover, so you were here, so give yourselves a great big hand. And all of you watching online, thank you for joining us. You're not as faithful as this group right here. Come on, let them know that. Oh, I'm teasing. We're so glad that you are with us. And I hope you had a great Christmas. How many of y'all had a wonderful Christmas day? Yes. How many of you so glad it's over? There you go. All the dads went like this. 
Well, I hope you had a, a great, great Christmas, and what a wonderful Christmas season we've had here at CLC. It was amazing. Had over 4,600 people kind of uh, watch online or in person for our Christmas experience, which was amazing. Uh, just wonderful Christmas Eve services. God's doing so many good things, and I don't know about you, but it's so uh, amazing to be a part of a church with leadership that says, even in a pandemic, even when uh, people are saying, what can't we do? We just keep saying, God, what do you want us to do? And God keeps using you and your church, and I don't know about you, but to me, that deserves a great applause to God for that. And, um, and this morning, um, I want to kind of begin to turn the page a little bit as we begin to say, what's next? And some of you went, man, what's next? I'm just trying to get over what was. And uh, what, is, what is next? What is God doing? Uh, past couple of weeks, Pastor Stan and I have been uh, just kind of praying and talking and saying, what is the next season? What is, what's next? And, and how do we begin to prepare for what's next? What's next for our lives? What's next for our, our church? What's next for the world? And, and um, not that we would have the answers, but the reality is, is what is God preparing us for, for what's next? And part of that journey that we're going to do as a church uh, beginning January 9th is uh, we are going to have a week-long Daniel fast as a church as we begin to come together in unity and say, God, what are you doing that is next? And we're going to uh, be in prayer and fasting for one another, for our lives, for our church, and really for the impact that God's calling us to make and to say, God, speak to us. We only want to do what you want us to do, go where you want us to go, say what you want us to say. And then part of that, uh, of that Monday, January 10th through Friday, every day we're going to have two one-hour times of prayer that we would have loved to invite you uh, to be a part of in our West Odd at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, Pastor Stan's going to lead that one because, well, it's 6.30 in the morning. And... Um, and then I'll be here at 6.30 that evening, and we're just going to have an hour of concentrated prayer going, God, we want to hear from you. How many would just want to hear from God about God, what is next? Amen. And that's what we're really preparing our hearts for. And this morning, I want to talk about preparing for what's next. How many know no matter what is next, there's a time of preparation that God calls us to? And uh, we're going to look at the life of a man named Joshua and just talking about how he prepared for what was next. Yesterday uh, at Christmas, you know, as a dad, what I've learned is don't really get your hopes up for anything ex exciting that's going to be handed to you for Christmas. You know, and see, there's something they made and moms love the noodle necklace that you made, but dads were like, yeah, that's great. You know, we're not going to hang it, we're not going to display it, we're going to shelf it, or we're going to, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, that or the socks or the underwear or whatever it may be. Um, and so uh, yesterday we were all done, we had a great Christmas and just hanging out with my family and, my, and everybody said, we got one more gift. Um, and, and they said, Dad, we got you something really special. And so I'm thinking, oh man, this is going to be like Rice crispy drawers or something, you know, really fancy. And... Um, and I say that because only that's what they got me last year. And, um, and so they said, uh, close your eyes. And they opened, uh, they presented to me a brand new uh, reclining chair. Awesome. Yeah, well, clap for a second. Um, here was the problem with that. I have a reclining chair. I've had the same chair for 25 years. It's the very first and maybe the only new piece of furniture me and my wife have ever bought. And that thing has been on the journey of life with me. It smells, it's stained. It's amazing. And so uh, my wife said, I'm tired of seeing you sitting in that chair. Now here's the reality, my chair is pretty broken. I'm talking about the armrests are broken and they kind of got a sag to it. The springs are coming loose. Matter of fact, it's so broken, here's the piece of the whole support that fell off when we just scooted it out of the way. And uh, they gave me that chair and, and they, I'll be honest with you, I had to figure out over the years how to get adjusted in the chair to make it comfortable, but I knew how to get it adjusted. It, it was kind of like had bad shocks, it sank over like that. It was perfect just the way it was. And they gave me the chair, and we put it in there, and before I sat in the new chair, I had to sit one last time in the old chair. Um, and I just thought about it. I'm not real sentimental, but that chair has been through a lot with me. Me and that chair, man, we've, we spent some time together. Man, that was the chair. I, uh, all four of my children, I would rock them in as a dad. I'd sing to them. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. Uh, that was the chair I would watch the Ohio State Buckeyes win their national championships in. 
And then after November, this kind of happened. <laughs> and, um, and I looked at that chair, and I realized in that moment, um, I was never going to move on to the new chair if I didn't get rid of the old chair. And the problem was I had gotten comfortable sitting and broken. And for many of us in our lives, it's the same way. We've gotten comfortable at times sitting and broken. And we have found a way to get comfortable in the brokenness around us. And we look at a world today, and, and, and sometimes the biggest question we can ask is, God, when is this going to end? When is this pandemic going to end? When is this tension going to end? When are all these things going to end? And we think at the end of the thing that we want the end for, that's where we're going to find peace. And, and so what happens is we just stay in the place waiting for something to end. But I believe that this is the greatest opportunity the church could ever have and the brokenness and the discomfort of humanity, that it's really an opportunity for the church to, to step in. And I think many of us, uh, we've been through so much over these last year and a half or, or two years, whatever it may be, that we look back and we're just going, God, when is this going to end? When can I get comfortable back in the brokenness that I was in? But what I believe is that God is calling us to begin to step out into what's next. See, we have no control over when things will end. We have no control over this pandemic. There's more variants. There's more. We're saying the same things now that we said a year ago. And we thought, when is this going to end? When this ends, everything's going to be okay. And the truth is this, is that we may not have control of the end of the things that we see that are painful and broken, but we do have control when we walk in obedience and step into what's next that God has for us. What is God speaking to us? What is God saying to us individually? What is God preparing you for next year? This next season, this next time, I'm not talking about a resolution. You're going to do it. You're going to lose 10 pounds this, this year. Forget that. You know it's not going to happen. Just go ahead and get rid of that resolution. Don't set yourself up for failure like that. But what is it that God is speaking to you about what's next? And when we look at our lives, we, we see all of the obstacles and all of the pains and all of the barriers that keep us from moving forward. And we see them in front of us, and at best, the best we can do is to sit back out in the comfortable of brokenness. But what I want you to know is that God created you and planned you, and God has a plan, and God has promises for your life. And God's plan for your life is not to go back to the broken, but to step into what's next, because God has a plan for our lives, for our church, and for us to make an impact in a world that needs to know him desperately. And so when we talk about preparing for what's next, I wanted us to go back into the Old Testament and look at a man named Joshua. Now, if you're not familiar with Joshua, many of you are, but Joshua was a, a warrior. He was a, he was a leader uh, under a man named Moses. The Israelites had been uh, enslaved uh, and they had become slaves. These were supposed to be God's people, but Pharaoh took them captive, and for generations they were enslaved. And this is about 500 years after that God made a promise to, to Abraham that says that, that your people will be blessed, that you'll be a father of many, that, that through you all nations will be blessed. And now here's what's supposed to be this promise is enslaved. And we know that Moses begins to lead these people out of slavery um, into the wilderness, headed to this promised land. And, and it's a land that's supposed to be their promise and a blessing. But from the time that God delivers them from this place of, of brokenness and slavery and bondage to the time that they get into or get ready to go into this promised land is about 40 years. And halfway through the journey, as soon as they get out, people begin to become disgruntled. It's no different than what we would see today. People are complaining about everything. They're, they're complaining about the manna, the food that God's providing every day. They're complaining about the water. They're complaining about the circumstances. They're complaining about how it used to be easier. And so their big idea was, let's just go back to the slavery that we were in. Let's go back to the brokenness of comfortable. Let, let's just go back but Moses and his faithfulness continues to push them through. And they're there for about 40 years. 
And a young man named Joshua rises up in, in the time, and he's just a faithful leader. He goes through all of it. He's just pursuing God, loving God, trusting God, believing God for what is next. And in the book of Hebrews, it talks a little bit about this, this journey. And, and he says this to us. And he says, Hebrews 10, do not throw away your confidence. How many of us, maybe we've lost our confidence today? Confidence that God will do something. Confidence that God is moving. Confident that there's going to be more for our lives. Confident that God's on the move. For many of us, our confidence has been robbed. He says, don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. And I love this verse in the NIV. It says, you need to persevere. You need to persevere. You need to persevere. You need to persevere. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And this whole scripture is telling us it is not going to be easy and there's going to be struggles. Don't quit. Don't give up. Prepare for what is next. And, and they find themselves in the wilderness. But I want you to know that, that whenever there's the promises of God of what's next, there's going to be the delay in the journey. And the Israelites get out of Egypt. And what should have been an 11-day walk turned into a 40-year wandering in the wilderness. They were looking and looking and looking back and they weren't trusting God for what was ahead. See, the wilderness was God's design because the wilderness was the preparation that they would get to know God. For they had not really known God and in that moment they wanted God, that God wanted to get to know them and, and that God's hand was on their life so that when they went into the promised land they wouldn't forget about God. How many of us do that? Man, we just want God to end this so we can have that. And when we get that, we forget what God had done on the journey. And God says, you're not going in until your hearts are right. And really a whole generation dies away. And another generation steps up and goes, what's next? And here they are, and, and we're going to be in the book of Joshua. They're um, in Joshua chapter 1. They're right on the cusp of the promise, the promised land that God has for them. And the only thing standing between them and that promise is a city. It's the oldest uh, inhabitable city that we know in the world. It was called Jericho. And Jericho's right there. And around Jericho are about 40, 45 foot walls. There's three of them. And now they're sitting at the edge of their promise of what's next. And the only thing they can see is the barrier, the wall between them and God's promises. I wonder how many of us, we've, we've built walls between us and God's promises. See, when they saw the wall, they saw the suffering, they saw the heartache, they saw the disappointment. They saw the opposition and the obstacles. And we see the wall and we see the impossibilities of the wall in front of us. That we forgot to keep dreaming about what was on the other side of the wall. We just saw the wall and what we wanted to do was maybe just go back and just be comfortable in brokenness rather than being disappointed at pursuing the heart of God. And Moses, their man, leads them there. And now in Joshua chapter 1, I want to walk through some of the scripture today. We're going to go through uh, quite a bit of scripture. Chapter 1, then we're going to jump over to chapter 6. The great theologian C.S. Lewis wrote one time, there are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. And that was so true for me because I remember sitting in that chair Last night, thinking the broken chair, all the times I held my children, all the times I rocked my children, my prayers to my children, my prayer wasn't that they would just stay where they were. My prayer was that God would grow, raise them up to be men and women of God who would do great things. And the temptation is to always want to go back to the good old days. But as I reflect on what God has done, he was answering my prayers then, now, and that God is moving forward. And it's so easy to want to go back that we fail to see what God has done to get us where we were. And that's kind of where they are, that there's this preparation. And now in chapter 1, verse 1 of Joshua, it says, And after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord says to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. The death what felt like the dream, all hope, the any hope they had left was in this one person. And here's what God says in such comforting words. He says, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready. Now get ready. 
See, when it seems like the circumstances and the situation in front of you are dead and you want to give up, God doesn't say, uh, sit down. God says, get ready. Get ready for what I'm going to do. Get ready for what is next. Get ready, get ready, get ready. And our temptation is to sit down and, and to at best reflect and at, at, at worst give up all hope. But he says, get ready, get ready to cross the Jordan to the land that I'm about to give you to the Israelites. I will give you every place where your foot set. That as I promised Moses, your territory will extend from Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates, and all the Hittite country, the Mediterranean Sea to the west. And no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. See, what Joshua was doing was being faithful and hearing from God about what was next. And God's promises for, for, for Moses and God's promises for Joshua are God's promises for us that he will never leave you nor forsake you. But the temptation is to sit at the wall, at the barrier of our dreams, and to forget about what is next, thinking God has forgotten you. God has not forgotten you. God is preparing you, and he's asking you to get ready for what is next. But the problem is we stopped asking what is next and we asked God to take us back to what was. But God is not in the, the business of taking you back. He's in the plan, business of fulfilling his plan of taking you forward. And when we think the wilderness is a thing that is there to kill us and discourage us, it's really the season to prepare you for what is next. And when you despise the wilderness, you fail to know the God of the wilderness. Think about it. Our world seems to be going to hell in a handbasket. We, everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, there's, there's distrust, there's brokenness, there's fear, there's, there's all kinds of bad news. And we choose to listen to the bad news rather than the good news of the one who sent us. See, we think that God forgets us or forsakes us, and so we stop dreaming about what could be next because all we see is the barrier in front of us. And I would rather sit in a bad, broken chair than try to get uncomfortable in something new. At least I knew where the spring was going to get me. But God's saying, I want you to get ready for what's next. I want to share with you what is next. And he says to Joshua, get ready, get ready, get ready, get prepared. And here's the problem. Most of us, though, when we're not getting a voice from God and hearing from God, what we do is we get a bad perspective. And the Israelites had a bad perspective. They had a perspective of, of all those times they tried to do it on their own. They had a perspective of obstacles. They had the perspective of a wall in front of them that they could not tear down. And the walls that we carry are the walls of disappointment and heartache and hardship and brokenness. We put the wall of comfortable. We put the wall of the good old days. We put all of these walls in front of us that seem impossible that God could do something next. So we stop preparing for what is next. And we start settling for what was. And a bad perspective always causes barriers to God's promises in your life. Listen to this perspective. Now go to chapter six with me. The first sentence is so profound. If you really read the scriptures, it's so powerful. The first sentence is their perspective. The second sentence is God's perspective. It says, it says, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Because of them, they thought, there's a barrier. We can't get in, and they can't get out. See, their focus was on the, the barrier, not on the God of the promises. And many of us, we stop dreaming, we stop hoping, we stop uh, switching, and we just want to, at best, be comfortable. But I just want to go ahead and just say this. God is not trying to get you comfortable in life. And if you've come to, to church and you've come to God saying, God, make me comfortable, man, you've come with the wrong perspective. 
God doesn't want to make you comfortable. He wants to make you effective and powerful. God doesn't want you to become so comfortable that you forget about him on the journey. And their perspective was this barrier. No one can get in. Now listen to God's perspective. Now this sentence is so profound in scriptures. You've got to read it. That God is making an emphatic and present statement about a future event. He says this. Then the Lord says to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. What do you mean you've delivered them into our hands? All I see is a wall, and all I see is an army, and all I see is an obstacle. And God says, see, I've already done it. See, I've done it. See, I've done it. But all Joshua could see was the wall, and what God wanted him to see was the victory. He says, see, I've delivered them into your hands and all its kings and fighting men. And here's the preparation. I want you to march around the city once, or at once with all the armed men, do this for six days. Have you ever felt like God asked you to do something that made no sense? Right? So you want me to march around this wall for six days? You want me to get my elite fighting guys? You want us to separate? You want us to go have them go away from the families? God, you don't want us to go fight? You don't want us to go battle? Uh, you, you don't have it all set up for us? You want us to march? God's taking the football team and turning them into the marching band. You want us to march around this wall for, for six days, do this for six days, and have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horns in the front of the ark, the army in the presence of God. And on the seventh day, march around seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. And when you hear them sound a long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. And then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up and everyone, or everyone will go straight in. Have you ever read things in the scriptures that have sound really good when it's done, but if you put yourself there at the beginning, you're thinking... What's this? Because if I said, hey, man, let's all get together. What we're going to do is we're going to go march around with some ram horns. And we're just going to walk around it once a day. And here are these men, and they're, they're walking, and they, God gets this army, this, these elite uh, warriors. And he says, what we're going to do is we're going to march around. We're going to walk around once a day. And the journey would have been about an hour. So they show up. They walk for an hour. And they go down, and they go back home. And, and the temptation would be, well, God already told me what to do on the seventh day, so let's do that today. And here's what I want you to know, that when what's next in the preparation is that you can't skip process to the promises of God. That the process is not ultimately about what you're doing, it's about what God is developing and some of you, you've been in process and you think, if I could just skip the process, if God would just tell me the whole thing, if God would just show me the end, man, it would be okay. I, well, I would go ahead and do that. Here's the thing. God puts the process in place to develop you so that you're prepared for the promises. This year, 2021, brought along uh, another 16-year-old. My son turned 16 this year. That's about how I felt. <laughs> Now, my daughters, they were not as confident in their driving ability. They actually understood that you needed to actually take driver's ed and learn the laws and rules. My son was much more confident in his driving ability, having never driven and never read a book about driving in his life. <laughs> Dad, I'm a great driver. Let me have the keys. The problem is he's been saying that for a couple of years. He was ready to go. And some of you men right now go, well, I could drive when I was 12 too. I used to pull my mom, I drove the tractor. And all of a sudden, you're now in this place, in this space where he's like, I can do this. But here was the deal. The, the, the process of developing him was ultimately to prepare him to be ready for the promise of being able to drive. See, we live in a world that you have to put more schooling in to drive a car than to have a kid. Because if they would have taught me all that about kids, I would have never had kids. And so here we are, we're in this space and we're in this place and now they're going, do what I've told you to do and see if we skip process from the promises, we miss what God is doing and the process is ultimately about developing us. And so now let's go to verse six. It says this, so Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest and he said to them, take the ark of the covenant and the Lord and the seven priests and carry the trumpets in front. 
And he ordered the army, advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. And when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the trumpets went forward, blowing their trumpets and the ark of the covenant followed them in the army. And here's how the men operate. The army marched ahead of the priests, blew the trumpets in the rear, and they were all excited and worked up. It says, all this time the trumpets were sounding, meaning this. They were going to go ahead and march and they were going to skip the process and declare the victory. And Joshua says, no, 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 no. This is the process of faithfulness to be developed for God's promises. God's developing us for his promises. And some of us get frustrated in the process And we either try to declare victory when God didn't ask us to declare victory and we find ourselves frustrated and defeated or we see the process and we think it makes no sense. There's no reason to do it. I just want to get God's blessings now. But what's next will always take a process because process always precedes promotion. That's why God would let them stay in the wilderness for 40 years before he would let them go into something they weren't ready for. Because the promise was ultimately about God's plan for God's kingdom, not their comfort for their life. See, everything God calls us to is ultimately for a plan that he's trying to build that is bigger than us. And so it says they, they, they carried it around. Listen to this. So he says in verse 11, so he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once, and the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. Can you just imagine these men? We, well, we went, we come home. The wives said, what'd you do today? Did you take the army, big guy? Did you get it? Did you you take down the city? Well, we walked around the city once. That's all you did? Yeah, I mean, I guess Joshua has a plan. I don't know. We've been out here 40 years. This ain't going to work. What are you supposed to do? Show up tomorrow. What are you going to do? Walk around the city one time. Second day they go back, they walk around. Maybe today's the day. Maybe today's the day we're supposed to do something. Maybe today... And they walked around the wall. And then they did it for the third day, and the fourth day, and the fifth day. God, we've been at this for five days. This is silly. Then they came back and they did it for the sixth day. And I don't know about you, but I'd be tempted to quit at that point. That's just called an exercise class. And our temptation is in the middle of the process and believing God for what's next is that we give up the journey and we allow frustration. But here's what's happening. God's having them march around this wall to remind them of one thing. The wall and the barrier is not their battle. The wall and the barrier is not their battle. He wanted them to get their eyes off the wall and their eyes on the presence of God. Because the presence of God will tear down the walls and the barriers of your life. But we've been building walls of hurt and disappointment and unforgiveness and frustration and fear. We've been building barriers and barriers and barriers. And we've been carrying this weight and carrying this weight. And before we know it, we can no longer see the promises of God. We see the barriers between us and the promises of God. And we get frustrated with God. And what God is doing is he's removing the idea of the wall because the wall was not the battle that you were supposed to fight. See, the wall was the barriers of your past and your past is forgiven, your past is cleansed. God has a plan for your life and no matter what barrier you think is between you and the promises of God, it is not your battle because the battle has already been won. The victory has been declared. And it says this in verse 14, so on the second day they marched and they returned to the camp and they did this for six days. Can I tell you what faith does? Faith ultimately keeps you in the process. It keeps you in the process. And the process of God is you can look back and you can see what God's done even when it's not evident in the moment. I look back, my daughter and I were driving up from Cincinnati this morning and she said, Dad, I can't believe it's almost 2022. She's like, this year has flown by. We feel like it's flown by. Just flown. But if I would have told you a year ago that, man, we're still going to have 
election tensions, and we're going to have uh, COVID, and now we're going to have variants of things, and we're going to have frustration. Man, all that's going to happen, but God's going to make it fly by, and you will be standing at the end of this, that no matter what the world threw at you, no matter what the variant was, that you would be sitting here the day after Christmas, and that you could see that the hand of God has been on you. You'd go, yes, but in the journey, you wanted to stop being faithful. You just wanted to stop on the walk. You wanted to stop, and, and you just wanted, at times, all of us, man, we just wanted to throw our hands up in the air, but as we look back, we can see how God's hand, we can look back as a church and we can go, it would have been easy to shut it down. It would have been easy just to think about ourselves, but we didn't. The church and leadership and Pastor Stan said, no, we're going to keep marching forward. We're going to plant churches. We're going to give more money away than we've ever. We're going to feed children around the world. We're going to see people come to Christ. We're going to watch God do something. We're going to get our eyes off the barrier and our eyes under the presence of God because the presence of God will lead you to what's next. And then on the seventh day, they got up at daybreak. And let's be honest, let's just really put ourselves in this. Here we go again. Now, now Joshua said we gotta get up early for church. Let's go guys, we're gonna walk again. Man, we've been walking every day. God ain't done nothing yet. God ain't done nothing. So but here they, they go walking. They get done walking once. They go, well, that's it, let's go home. No, we're going to do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And what he says is we're going to be faithful, and faithful, and faithful, and faithful, and faithful, and faithful. See, we are not required. Listen, it is not on us to win the battle. It's on us to be faithful in following God on the journey for the battle that has already been won. And when you get your eyes off the faithfulness and you try to get it on the fruit, you will miss it every time, but they just kept going around and around and around. And the seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And we read it and we go, man, they shouted and it won. But let me ask you something. If you said shout, would you have the faith to do it? Because what they thought was going to win the battle was a sword and a shield. And what God was showing them is when you will shout in faith for the victory and be faithful in the promises, I will do more than you could ever dream or imagine. Because you can't tear down that wall. You can't tear down the wall of your past. You can't tear down the wall you've been carrying. And, and whatever is going to be next, let me tell you something. It's going to feel different and look different. We're going to be seasons of transition to church. There's going to be, there's going to be things that will happen around the world. And if we prepare ourselves today, we will see the opportunity that God is calling us to step into. And, and we will then begin to fight the right battle. See, the wrong battle is to try to get everything to stop, to end. But what God is calling us to do is be faithful in it so that when the brokenness of humanity is where it is. The church can be the church and we can shout the victory of Jesus to the brokenness of humanity and see Jesus' church grow. We were not called to fight the wall. We were called to be faithful with the dream. It says, and they shout and the Lord has given them the city. And when the trumpet sound and the army shouted, the sound of the trumpet when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. For some of us, we've been so focused on the barrier to what's next that we've forgotten about the God of the dream. We forgot about what could be, and we sit back to what was. And at best, our prayers that God would make us comfortable again. And what I learned is when I truly reflected, my, my comfort was really broken. And I just found a way to be comfortable in brokenness. And God doesn't want you to be comfortable in brokenness. He wants to do a new thing in you, the next. Here's the struggle, though. For some of us, we don't know what is next. 
What is God doing in your life? What is God saying to you in the next season? For some of you, I don't even know, man. I'm just trying to get through the day. What if next year was the year that we heard from God? For some of you that you seem confused about what's next, can I just tell you this line that maybe you can ponder over the next couple of weeks? So as we come together and pray as a church about what's next for us, for our church, for our, our globe, that wherever I have confusion, I need a word from God. See, without clarity, I can't find direction. And for some of us, we stopped asking God for clarity. We wonder why our life is so confused. And so we're going to make this a time leading up to that that we're going to say, God, speak to us. What's next? And when you say that without any of the hindrances, God, what's, what's next as long as I'm good? Just, just God, what is it that you have me for, preparing me for? Once I have clarity of where God wants me to go, I will have clarity on how God wants me to prepare. And then for others of you, that's fearful. Because the wall in front of you seems so overwhelming from your past. Disappointment, bitterness. Stop trusting God. Where was God in this? Man, stop believing that God could do a miracle. Stop, man, you, you've been hurt, you've been wounded, you've been disappointed, you've been let down, you've been sick. You, you see all these obstacles. And you finally look up and you can't even see God. You just see the obstacle. I know what that's like. And so you got so tired of looking at the wall we get the heart of the Israelites and go, maybe we should just go back to what was at least comfortable. But God doesn't want you to go back. God wants you to see the promise. So for you, I would encourage you with this thought to ponder over the next two weeks. Wherever I have fear, I have an area in my life that is not submitted to God. Perfect love casts out all fear. So man, Maybe you have a fear of the future. Maybe you have a fear of being let down. Maybe you have a fear of all these things, and these are the obstacles. Perfect love casts out fear. It's an area of my life that I'm not trusting with God. And fear is the greatest tool of the enemy. If he can get you to look at the wall long enough, you'll stop dreaming on what's on the other side. You go, man, I just want to tear that wall down. God didn't ask you to tear it down. God said, I'm tearing down the wall. Would you begin to trust me in the process? So here's what we're going to do this morning. If you'll just indulge me for just a second, even online, all of you. If you just grab a piece of paper and a, and a pen, or even if you don't do it, would you just act like you are so I think I feel good about this? Otherwise, I'll have to preach longer and just to kind of. And here's what I want us to do as Zach leads us in the song. Then we're going to come back and pray and we're going to dismiss. But I want you to write down, either if you're in that place of these barriers, just acknowledge what they are. God, I. I I don't want, I don't know what's next. I'm afraid, God. I, I'm a, man, I'm, I'm tired, God. I'm weary. I'm worn out. What's the barrier between you and the next that God has for you? The promise. Or maybe you're sitting here and you're going, God, I need clarity, a word for what is next. What's this next season? Because, God, I'm ready to go all in, to be obedient and faithful. 
Lord, I don't want what I can do on my own, but I want to know what it is that you want me to do. Lord, speak to us, speak to our church, whatever it is. And I just want you to write saying, God, I need clarity and wisdom in this because I only want to do what you want me to do. What if it's in this next year when we said next, we said, what's next? What's next to my life, our church, for the world? What if we said, and what's next? I, God, I only did what you wanted me to do. I prepared for you where you wanted me to go. Even when I didn't understand it, even when I didn't fully uh, comprehend all that it was, Lord, this next year, I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to be fixated on you. Here's what I know. It may not make sense in the moment, but the victory is in the faithfulness because I don't want another year of doing my own thing. I want to see God's hand move in my life in a way that I've never seen before. How many would say you're with me on that? So here's what I'll do. Let's just take a couple minutes and I want you to write this down. You're not going to turn in. No one's going to look at it. But over the next two weeks, I want God to speak to you in those areas. Let's write this. Is where you meet us. Take me there, take me there. If what you need is just an offering, it's right here. My life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord here's my life, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you Lord, here's my life. If your glory wants to come down, let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it ablaze, and I'll be young.
purified You take whatever you desire Lord, here's my life I want to be turned by fire Purified You take whatever you desire Lord, here's my life. I felt like this message was really for our church today. I feel like God just been stirring me. Church, I don't want average Christianity anymore. I want to see God move in such a way. And Lord, I don't know what's next in my life. I don't know what's next for church. I don't know what's next for you. Here's the thing. I just know the author and the finisher of our faith. And what would it look like if we as a people, all of us online, we were people that said, God, we want clarity from your word about what's next. We want to hold each other accountable and walking in faithfulness. And we want to see the greatest harvest of souls in this next year that CLC has ever seen. We want to be the response. And though we have no control when something will end, we do have control where we begin. And that begins with saying, God, we need a fresh word from you because what is next is all about your kingdom. And you don't have to fight a battle. You just have to be faithful with the march. Would you stand with me today? As you stand, I just want to remind you that this next couple weeks, it's really a time that we need to get ourselves set aside to say, God, we need to hear from you. We need clarity and we need peace. Because this next season, God, we want to walk into the promises. And so on your paper, I just want to pray with you today. And my encouragement to you is to keep that with you. Be praying over that. And so when we come to January 10th, we will be praying every night, every day. For that, we're going through a fast. I'm excited to see what God does when we start our Celebrate Recovery January 24th. We're going to see people that are coming with broken, brokenness and hurts and habits and hangups coming from around our city to come to Christ. Here's what I know. God, God didn't ask us to fix anything. God just asked us to step into the center of brokenness so that we could be at the center of solution. Because the world is broken. Because they need you to step into them with the message of Jesus. God, I thank you for this amazing family called CLC. Lord, for some, they have been carrying these weights of fear and brokenness and disappointment. That Lord, it ultimately have become a barrier for them walking into the next season that you have for them. God, I pray today pray today, Lord, that you would give them the power by your spirit to stop fighting a battle they were not designed to fight and they would fixate their eyes on you, the one who's already said the battle has been won. That, Lord, you would begin to move in their hearts that that fear would become submitted, that God, that That place that they thought was brokenness will be confidence. The thing they thought was a barrier will ultimately be a ramp into their promised land. God, for those that are saying, Lord, we just want a word from you about what's next. We want clarity. God, speak to us. For Lord, just like Moses said, Lord, if we're not people of your presence, then what would make us different than any other people on the face of the earth? God, we at your church, at CLC, we want to be people of your presence. Led by your word. Believing God. Believing that your promises are true. And though we don't always understand the process, we want to be found faithful on the journey. 
God, for those that just want to return to back to comfortable. I understand that, God. But Lord, I just pray you would come alive in our hearts so that we could see that you're a God of promises and a plan and that you're not going to leave us nor forsake us. And that, Lord, we would love, rather live the life of the unknown on a path with you than in the comfort of our brokenness on the path that we plan for ourselves. Because we know that in due time, we will see a harvest like we've never seen before. God, I love you and I thank you for this amazing church. Bless all those online. Bless these families around this auditorium today. And let them know, Lord, that they were created in your image and likeness. And your plans for them are far greater than the walls in front of them. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Come on, let's give God a great big hand this morning. I love y'all. And don't forget, next week, uh, as we, this is our last Sunday of 2021. It's hard to believe that next weekend we will not have service on Saturday, uh, but next Sunday we'll be together. And just want to encourage you to be praying and, and seeking God. If you're a guest, we would love an opportunity to meet you in our VIP room. We have a gift that we'd like to give you just to get a chance to know you. Shake your hand. Thank you for coming. Have a great weekend, guys. God bless y'all.